G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today we're gonna to do another edition of Unpopular Opinions. I've sort of been doing this about once a month for the last year, and today we're gonna to do a November version, which is mostly centered around list management, a little bit of the draft, and some general talking points as well. A number of days ago, I put out a post on the YouTube community tab, like I always do, and I mentioned that I've sort of hit a bit of a creative block as we get into November. And we had so many people come through with some really good video idea suggestions, so I thank you for that. What I was sort of looking for was more your Unpopular Opinions to use in a video like this. So we, we had a wide range of comments, which I appreciate, and I will take them on board in terms of video ideas over the coming weeks. And some of them were videos I already had in mind anyway. So what I've done is I've scoured through the comments and I'm gonna put the ones that qualify as an unpopular opinion or a very interesting talking point nonetheless, and sort of park the video idea suggestions. Although again, I will take them on board and I've read them. I haven't had a chance to comment in reply yet. So without further ado, let's crack into what some people are saying. So the first one is from Joshua Kelty who says, Maybe not unpopular, but relevant to this time of year, Cal Toomey is the best journo in the business. I'm a fan of Cal Toomey. Absolutely uh, no complaints there. I suppose, I think somebody else pointed this out in the comments. I think when your role or you know your main niche in the footy world is, is providing insight into draftees and uh, you know commenting on trade rumors and stuff, it's hard to be controversial. You're kind of just relaying on information there. I do think he does a wonderful job, but, but if you compare that to the type of journos who are you know commenting throughout the season on current events and having opinions on the football that we're seeing and we all share opinions on, I feel like that's a much harder gig and therefore you're always gonna have people, regardless of how professional you are, etc., that kind of dislike you. So for instance, like a Kane Corns is so divisive, but in terms of evaluating his integrity, you know, as a, he's not really a journalist, I suppose, he's more of a pundit. My point being, it's just so much easier to piss people off when, you, when you're doing that particular niche and you see that he doesn't really stray into the trade and draft stuff. He will comment on big contracts, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I still agree Cal Toomey is awesome and I'm a big fan of both him and Riley Beveridge and Gettable. I think they do a great job. But it is a niche that is much harder to piss people off in. ASMR Elliot says, Jagger Smith and Josh Smiley shouldn't even be considered in the first five picks of the draft. That is a hot, hot take because I think Jagger in particular is considered pretty likely to go top five, whereas Smiley, I don't think at this current stage in time, won't. But let's discuss them as prospects. So Jagger, he's a very high production and consistent midfielder who, you know, steps up to the level and wins heaps of the footy and has no trouble adapting to a higher standard. We've seen him go to the VFL and win tons of the footy. I take it the knock on him is probably around just hurt factor. You know, he gets a lot of possessions, but maybe isn't as impactful per possession as some other prospects. So I'm going to assume that's what you're referring to when you say Jagger shouldn't go top five, because if you just look at it on performance, he's one of the best, if not the best performed midfielder this year. Smiley started the year as a genuine pick one contender and probably didn't rise to the heights. I think his first month in the Coach Talent League was really strong, putting up big numbers. And then particularly in the championships, I think he averaged less than 20 possessions. And that's a tough one. I'm sort of willing to excuse Smiley a little bit for his numbers dropping off. I think the uh, Reality is like in the chance when there's so many other good midfielders, you get shifted around the ground. And I just wonder with Smiley, the fact that he's not really a good forward probably hurt his performance in the champs. Whereas if he's just allowed to be that number one midfielder on an ongoing basis, like he seemed to be in the Coats Talent League, he can easily put up 30 plus possession games. So where they'll fall on draft night is interesting. Um, there is a suggestion that, you know, if Richmond hold picks one and two, Jagger could be there, but at this current stage of time, they don't hold pick two. So Jagger could present as a pretty good pick two option for Richmond if they've already got a Lawler. So it's kind of about what they're already offsetting, what they've already got. You could see teams like Carlton and Adelaide who have one bite of the apple in this draft, probably going for someone with a bit, little bit more point of difference. So then you look at Foss and you look at Sid Draper for those selections. As for Smiley, he presents as a big point of difference because he's a six foot four, potentially six foot five midfielder. So then you look at what you know, clubs who have selections in that first five to six and even someone like a St Kilda. If he provides something that is very different to what those clubs already have, you could see that sort of inflating his relative value. Dwayne the Explorer has a take on Fremantle. He says Fremantle should prioritize Cosy Pickett over Chad Warner. Frio's midfield is pretty solid, but they need speed. If Frio get Cozzy as well as Shea, they can almost always have one of them in the midfield, thus adding more speed. Plus, having the two elite small forwards is very valuable. On top of this, Cozzy will probably be cheaper than Chad. That is interesting take, because I think everyone universally agree that Chad Warner is the superior player as it currently stands. Fremantle's midfield is pretty well-rounded already, so I suppose you could say that Chad Warner would add something, but for the cost, and I do think it would be a salary cap issue 
at that point for Fremantle to get Chad Warner. I think in terms of financial, Chad Warner would probably be far more expensive. The thing that around Cozzy Pickett being cheaper is that if we're talking about trade collateral, him being contracted to Melbourne is going to be a big factor. So maybe an uncontracted Chad Warner still requires more in a trade than Cozzy Pickett, but I think that gap will be closed up given Cozzy's contracted until 2027. I see where you're getting at there with the positional need, like having a, a dynamic small forward that can rotate through the midfield. We know Cozzy Pickett can occupy midfield rotation. So I get what you're saying about the point of difference, and it probably is a bit more of a, a positional need. I think there's a fair argument to make. Do Fremantle need to go hard for Chad Warner? Am I a little bit biased because if Fremantle don't go for him, that increases his chances of getting to West Coast? Yeah, for sure. But I see what you're saying. I don't mind that take, to be honest. Seth Dryden, you should do a video on how Richmond's draft hair might be a curse for the development of the players' picks because they can't have all the players selected in one midfield without being overexposed and pushing out other developing players, which will harm development. Yeah, so I did a video on Richmond recently without necessarily touching on this particular point. It's a tough one. When you map out their best 23, and it's an ideal best 23, there is sufficient protection, particularly like that back line still has a lot of experience. Forward line's looking a little bit bare, um, and the midfield is spearheaded by Taranto, Hopper, and Prestia. So there are still some mature bodies in there. Where it would become a problem, I think, for Richmond is if they have even a medium amount of injuries. I'm not saying like a crisis like 2024 was, but it only takes a couple of injuries to say Taranto and Hopper, where you would probably be looking at a very overexposed young midfield. So I think this will be something they need to be careful with. Absolutely. You know, Presti is not a young man anymore. And if, say, him and one other midfielder go out and you've got a midfield of Lawler and Jagger Smith occupying serious minutes in their first season, I think that's a problem. So what I would do for Richmond is I'd probably be scanning the listed free agency market, particularly just for another midfield rotation. So the risk of sitting on the fence, I don't want to condemn Richmond to a, to a bad few years of development because I don't know how they're going to handle this situation, but I would absolutely want them to exercise caution on giving serious minutes to guys before they're ready. And the, the lack of list depth makes it a very real possibility. Got a few on the Eagles now. Dean says the Eagles' decision to slide from 3 to 12 will turn out to be a good one because quality in the top 15 of the even draft is marginally the same. Compared with next year when a top pick will be more important, AFL Snap says giving away pick 3 was a good thing. And Ash Warwick says unpopular opinion, moving Barris on is a great result for the Eagles. Short-term pain for long-term gain. Okay, so we'll separate those two things. First of all, the decision to slide from three down to 12. I mean, this ultimately just lives and dies with the selection of pick 12 and whether or not it's going to be used on a quality player. Now, my preference has always been for us to use that on a midfielder, and I'm still hopeful that is the case. Although it does seem like some of the best options around our pick someone like a Travaglia, for instance, he seems to be one of the favorites amongst Eagles fans to get that pick, but he's not a proven midfielder. So given that there's a, a glut of midfielders at the top end of this draft who do seem clearly better than, say, the next five or six midfielders, I think that's fair to suggest. Like, it is fairly even, but at least they're primary midfielders. That being said, it, it is possible that West Coast drafts Xavier Lindsay and he becomes an absolute star. And then absolutely, it will, will make, mean that the trade down from three to 12 won't be that much of a problem in hindsight. But it, regardless of how the pick goes after that, you still have to look at the trade. And I would say it wasn't a great use of assets by the West Coast Eagles. I've got closure over it. It's fine. I've moved on, but I'm not going to backflip on criticizing the trade. I don't think we received a good outcome there. We can salvage it by drafting really well. Absolutely. It's all academic once the draft actually happens. But I would suggest that even if we were going to trade three down because it's an even draft, what we got in return was probably contrary to what our needs are at the moment, and that's getting midfield talent. As for Barrist moving on to Hawthorne, I, I agree. There's a little bit of a rip off the band-aid moment from West Coast where a good, very good key position defender would have probably helped us be a bit more competitive in games or at least staunch the bleeding of some bigger losses. But at the end of the day, he was one of the only players on the list that could have been traded for a pretty good draft haul. And I would say that is what happened. So I think this worked out for all parties really well. John says, go home factors and how it affects this draft past and futures. So this one I think presents a little bit more as a, as a video suggestion, but we'll just involve it in here while we're talking about the draft generally. Um, yeah, it, it is unfortunately just one of those uncomfortable truths about the draft where it does seem every year there's a, there's a handful of players who sort of dictate where they're going to go in the draft. Now, a lot of people will probably look at, you know, when players are publicly interviewed and say, oh, I'm willing to go anywhere, but I, I wouldn't read too much into that. I, I do suspect that a lot of this is happening through player agents and player managers. For whatever reason, the reality is some players just don't want to leave home. 
And if you're a top end Victorian prospect, for instance, it's not just Victorians that go home, obviously, but if you are, then the chances of getting to a Victorian club are much higher. And those interstate clubs will be a little bit risk averse if a player has made it clear, or at least somewhat clear, that they're not really keen to leave the state. We undoubtedly see this affect draft strategy. I, I think we've seen it with West Coast personally as someone who's watched them closely and, and it's clear from GWS, I think they've been fairly explicit about that. They don't recruit from the same talent pool as other clubs. What can you do about it? Not a lot. You know, I, I want to make a video about this in general, but I, I think you'll find that the draft as a system, as a mechanism for getting players onto lists, I believe in the NRL, they found that the draft is not legally enforceable because it's a constraint of trade. So long story short, I think the AFL's power to really try and, and nip this problem in the bud, first of all, what can you really do? And second of all, you know, I, I do think the draft might be on the way out. Uh, eventually with the, with the rise of academies and the uncomfortable reality that some players will sort of dictate where they go in the draft. Yeah, it's a form of draft tampering, but if the draft is as a mechanism kind of hanging by a thread and this really went from push to shove, I don't know if the draft itself as a format would hold up that well, certainly legally. Real Swift says, it would be interesting to see your take on what you think the future of our league could look like. Things like Tassie, Team 20, technology and foreign expansion. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot to, to cover in just one uh, comment here, but I'm, perhaps that would be another video in itself. But we have another comment here that I'll tie in together. Jason Beck says, what about AFL in five years? Tassie have all the draft picks means not top end talent accessibility for bottom sellers. So stuck there for the next 15 years. Same size, just play finals for five consecutive years. Bottom four in 2030 will be Tassie, Eagles, Tigers, and Demons. So just quickly on, on Team 20, um, yeah, it's it's hard for me to know where the next team is likely to be. It makes sense that it would probably just be in another expansion market, which would lead to this weird reality where there's probably or possibly going to be more teams in Queensland, potentially, if they get Team 20, than, say, Western Australia and South Australia, um, who were traditional footballing states because... First of all, there's no market potential for growth in Western Australia or South Australia. A lot of the diehards usually have one of those teams, or perhaps they go for a, a Victorian team where their passion predates the AFL's expansion. And I believe that um, certainly in Western Australia, both football clubs are opposed to the idea of a third state team there. So to me, that kind of just points to the fact that like the Team 20 will probably be some sort of attempted expansion of the game. Now, whether that's Northern Territory, that could be viable. I don't know how viable that would be. To be honest, I think you'd need to rely a heap on local talent. I think it would be very hard to keep top end talent from Melbourne to go stay in Darwin. No, no disrespect to the city, but I think for a young person, it would be hard to keep guys like Harley Reid there. And if you can't keep like top end talent at your football club, you've got an enormous disadvantage already. And I just wonder whether it will be viable in a place like Darwin. So I, I don't really have a strong opinion on where it will be. I also kind of don't feel there's any need, real need to rush this. As for Tasmania and what that will look like when the team comes in, I think this is gonna be a fascinating thing. And I think it's going to be a video in itself that I intend to do uh, sometime during this month and look at which teams are best placed for Tasmania to come into the competition. It's really hard to speculate on who will be best placed when we don't really know the nature of how drafts will be compromised. So we can assume that 2027's draft will be pretty compromised, but I don't think it'll be exactly like GWS and Gold Coast because I think the AFL will look at the previous examples and make it easier for Tasmania to build an established team with established talent as quickly as possible and thus rely less on the draft. So one suggestion I read was that Tassie will come in with a, you know, a whole heap of first round picks that they, they can then trade for players. So will that mean less players move as free agents to Tasmania? They've got to be traded for. This does offer some reasonable protection to clubs who are going to lose players. Now, using that line of thinking, the teams that might be the most vulnerable to Tasmania coming in are those who are about to challenge and could potentially lose top end talent. Or could you say that you know the teams with the most Tasmanians are vulnerable? I mean, look at uh, North Melbourne with Colby McCurcher and the Bulldogs have Riley Sanders. I've got no opinion on whether those guys are likely to leave to Tasmania, but it's another consideration, right? You think Tassie would go hard at established Tasmanian talent. I also think we do tend to catastrophize exactly this impact it's going to have on the 27 draft. So I don't know, to give you an example, um, my team, West Coast, won the wooden spoon in 2010 when the Gold Coast Suns heavily compromised that draft. So West Coast entered the draft at pick four. They, they received a priority pick, which would ordinarily have been 
pick 17, and that became 26 that particular draft. Now, West Coast walked away from that tra- draft period with Andrew Gaff, who was a better player than any of the three players taken before him. Jack Darling was a premiership player. Scott Lysette, three picks later, premiership player. Then in rookie draft, we took Jeremy McGovern. So the idea that a team cannot succeed purely because the draft is compromised. It's logical, but it is not necessarily going to be the case. Now, it's no doubt going to have an impact, but I think it'll be interesting to see what teams do between now and then, because you still have the 24 draft, the 25 draft, and maybe the 26 draft will be compromised in some way. Like if they can pre-list 17 year olds, I think in the same way those other expansion teams did, that could take away from the 26 draft and that's fair enough. But I mean, I think I suppose broadly speaking, I don't think the teams that are at the bottom of the ladder right now are the most vulnerable. I think with Richmond's off season they've had, you know, draft access isn't going to be their problem. It will be a problem if they fail to get competitive in the next three or four years and are still down the bottom. But even by then, they should have enough draft picks. That won't be their biggest priority. North Melbourne should be sweet. Um, I would like to think West Coast should be fine as well. I mean, with the exception of this year, West Coast has had a pretty good commitment to the draft. And if by 2028, the Eagles aren't moving up the ladder, I'll be surprised as a fan. But also, I'd imagine they would have had a whole heap of draft talent by then. So then you look at teams who are probably really old right now and haven't been committed to getting talent in the door. Now, probably the biggest example of this is Collingwood. Again, I'll probably save my conclusions for when I actually get time to do this video. But you're looking at teams who have a lot of players over the age of 30 who haven't been hitting the draft lately. And Collingwood is probably the biggest example. But equally, because it's Collingwood, I think they'll be able to navigate through it. So... I'll be very surprised if by 2030, Tasmania, West Coast, Richmond, and even Melbourne will be in the bottom four because Melbourne as well have had a pretty good access to the draft in recent years and they hold two top 10 picks in this year's draft. So I think they'll be okay. Shramo says, I know it's been going around and getting louder, but Hawthorne sophomore blues, I think they might plateau and possibly go backwards. It is so hard to speculate on this. Um, You know, I think in many respects, they overachieved expectation for this year. And I, I certainly agree that it's not... Um, are given that they come back and, and be good again. There's so many different factors. I mean, with a young list as well, you know, it takes mental resilience to come back and be competitive um, when your expectations are higher. That, I think that will be a challenge for a lot of young guys on that team. And of course, the fact that they will be studied pretty hard over the preseason and teams will find ways to try and mitigate the way Hawthorne plays. So I, I don't really have much of an opinion on whether they'll slide, but I'm certainly not doing a cane cords and assuming that they're going to be premiership favorites for next year. I'd, I'd probably expect them to make finals, but if, I'll be very impressed. It will almost be just as impressive if they're as good again in 2025. I think they're on the right track and I have a pretty good confidence they will be a very good team for a while. I just don't know if that will be the case in 2025 specifically. Crispy Gamer says about the Crows next year with Neil Bullen coming and Pete Lee now at the club, the Crows shouldn't have any excuses if they don't make finals, especially if they have a fit, fit Tex Walker and Isaac Rankin for a majority of the season. I'm actually going to do an Adelaide video fairly soon, I think, uh, looking at their off-season as a whole and the fact that they'll add pick four, which it's hard to tell who that's going to be at the moment. I think the easy connection is Sid Draper, but if Carlton takes Sid Draper, who is it? Is it Jagger? I'm not convinced they'll take Jagger. They could go Harvey Langford. And that's a question for another time. But I think, you know, I, I believe that you can tell a club's intentions and their expectations for next year by their list management moves. And they are a team that has just loaded up on three established players. 2024 was disappointing for them after just missing out on finals the year before. I think no excuses to not make finals is probably fair from an internal point of view. Whether I've got them in my top eight next year, it's hard to tell. But they, you know, we lost a little trust with Adelaide this year, but they are still super young. It has to be remembered. Ben Parsons says, hot take. As a Collingwood supporter, I think Joe Richards will, uh, trading Joe Richards will come back to bite Collingwood next season. He would have had 12 to 14 games for Collingwood, I reckon, if he stayed. The forward line is older. Not sure how many games Jamie Elliott would play for us next season. He's in the good age range too. I think this is a fair take. I like Joe Richards. I remember him playing particularly well against West Coast. Um, this is a tough one. It may be that, you know, Collingwood really tried to keep him in it from all suggestions. I think they did. But whether Joe, you know, looked at what Port Adelaide were offering and it was probably a little bit more of a guarantee of game time. He saw that as an opportunity. Now, Collingwood, I presume, simply just couldn't guarantee him a spot in that best 22. Will it come back to bite them? It's possible, but it really depends how Joe Richards goes from here. And he's only played nine games. So I do share your concern, I suppose, in the sense that I could see him being a very good player, but we'll see. Glennie Drews, reassess pick two approach following Jaden Stevens' retirement. Consider how far North can feasibly, feasibly drop back for their targeted players and whether they can find potential suitors. Yeah, so this sounds like a little bit more of a video suggestion and I will do a video on it. Um, it's interesting, it gives another list spot that North Melbourne didn't have previously. Does that increase the 
impetus for them to want to get more picks in this year's draft? Potentially. I mean, in terms of the who the suitors are, straight off the bat, you think of Richmond. I heard a suggestion pick two in a future first for Richmond's 10 or 6 and 11. I think that's an awful trade for North Melbourne personally, but I could see them using that future first to trade aggressively into this year's draft. They can certainly dangle it. I guess the problem there is when you're looking at, let's call it a top three or four pick, that's my belief of what it will be. That is a good pick, but to motivate a St Kilda, for instance, who have seven and eight to trade with you, would they go two and a future first for seven and eight? I still think that's a bit of a rough deal for North Melbourne. Again, we'll go into more specifics in that video, but yeah, I do wonder if the Jaden Stevenson retirement increases North Melbourne's needs to go, say, maybe three picks of the top 20 of this year's draft. Sasha Elliott says, teams should not be able to get compensation in round one. Ben, one compensation affects all teams draft and trade capital. Yep, I think that's that's reasonable. Again, I'm not I'm not one of those people who wants to dispense with compensation picks entirely because I do think clubs do need some protection for leaving uh, players leaving at the end of their contract. I think things could get really messy if players from bottom clubs, let's say LDU, walk to another club and there was no compensation. I think that would be a bad outcome for the league personally. Could you insulate the first round entirely and say band one is now end of first round compensation? I do think that does go a little bit of a way to preserving the draft access of other clubs while still offering a compensation. So I suppose it's a bit of a compromise that I don't mind. Ryson says, I want to hear your opinion on Port's list spots at the moment. Currently, I'm seeing a lot of stuff about Port's uh, having two-ish more years in the premiership window, and that's it. I can't help disagree with that, as we are core players at the moment, especially in the midfield, have many years left. Do you think Port need to hit the drafts hard, or should we be prolonging our window by bringing in guys like Lukosius and Richards? I, I agree when you consider, you know, who a lot of Port Adelaide's best players are. They were still, you know, in the early years of their prime. And I think when you've got Jason Horn francis at the age of 21, um, and Butters and Rosie from 2018, and now... Lukosius added to that mix. I know there's a lot of mixed opinions on Lukosius, but I think there's enough still there in a good age bracket. I don't think Port Adelaide need to hit the draft hard. I think it's a good outcome for them to, to hold draft access this year because it has been a couple of years without hitting the draft. I see no reason to suggest that their window is only two years away. I think they can make moves to prolong that. Now, now I see a gun young midfield and, and probably they need some long-term options down back and up forward, particularly up forward. So I suppose... Take the picks in this year's draft, which is already happening anyway. And then I would still continue to look for mature players to round out their best 22. So yeah, I guess in theory, I do agree that I don't see why it would be two years, but they also still need to make moves. Maybe there's, there's a sense of needing to go back, to go forward again. But I'm not sure if an all-out assault on the draft is what I would do. I would probably look more in the mature player space. Gus Monfrey says, how about the AFL forcing Collingwood, Essen and Carlton to play all at GMHBA next year? And we'll see how Geelong goes. <laughs> all their interstate clubs like Frio Suns and the Eagles play four games in a row at their home ground like Collingwood, Richmond, Essen and in Melbourne. Change the fixture up a bit. If you dislike my idea, can we at least fix the fixture and make it even for every club to have a chance of winning the flag instead of disadvantaging certain teams? Yeah, there, there is an inherent um, bias, I suppose, to a big, powerful Victorian club who play their away games against Geelong, not at GMHBA. I mean, that is just clearly a money decision. And it is a less than ideal outcome, and particularly when you get to finals, right? Like if Geelong are hosting Collingwood at the MCG. I mean, Geelong are still pretty good at the MCG. When they're a good team, you still give them a chance, but it's not quite the same as having a home ground advantage. And then it's also unfair for someone like a Fremantle. Like, I think this actually came up back in 2013, I think I want to say, where Fremantle were forced to play a final at GMHBA because they didn't think they were going to get enough numbers to that game, whereas Fremantle undoubtedly probably would have preferred to play at the MCG. In the end, it didn't matter. Fremantle won the final anyway. And I think I'm remembering that correctly, but it, it is weird to have two sets of rules for things like that. As for Collingwood, Richmond and Essendon playing consecutive games at home, um, I think you also consider that a lot of their home games are neutral games too. So th I think that kind of evens up against interstate clubs, but the specific example of Collingwood, Essendon and Carlton never playing at GMHBA, that's actually unfair on Geelong. And it's also unfair on interstate clubs who then have to play there. Max Hansen's got a long one here. So buckle up. The draft is so compromised because this second round was uh, pick 21 but it'll end up as 29 for that specific argument father sons at academy picks don't compromise that pick by delaying it if there are four academy bids and one father son bid that delayed a certain pick it doesn't actually matter that they delayed that second rounder i know where you're going with this those academy and father sons were always going to be bid on they were never going to be an actual option to be drafted by your own club at that second round pick my argument doesn't apply to free agency or assistance packages as the players taken at those picks could have been taken by your club. All that the Academy and Father Son picks are doing is making the number of the pick itself higher, but it doesn't take away any potential talent 
from your club when they reach that second round pick. Yes, I see what you're saying. So if you look at a talent pool and remove all the academy players, it doesn't really matter where those bids come because it doesn't affect your talent pool. But I think the point is the fact that should these players be taken out of the talent pool at all? I can imagine a scenario where Levi Ashcroft, uh, that's a father-son and I do like father-son and I think they're a little bit different to academies. But let's just treat them all the same. Like if Levi Ashcroft was available, then Richmond would have him probably at pick one, I'd imagine, or at least pick two if they had same thing with Leonardo Lombard, Isaac Kako. If you added these guys back to the draft pool, the whole draft pool still gets stronger. So when it's a question of whether these academy systems should exist, it is absolutely relevant and fair to say that the draft pool is compromised because you've got to remove a whole heap of players to whittle down to the actual talent pool that is accessible to you. And I think where it gets iffy is like in some cases, a team's academy may have really contributed to that player being a good player, but there's probably heaps of examples where academy players were probably going to be absolute guns anyway. So it creates a weird result where one team arbitrarily has a connection to that player and is able to draft them. But long story short, I would still say it is absolutely a case of being compromised when you have to take these players out of the initial talent pool before the draft even starts. I think we're on a one-way track to academies being a much more dominant force. And, and to be honest, I, I think that's actually a reasonable argument to include in the Tasmania conversation. If, if we're moving to a fu future where it is now really incentivized to have a really strong academy producing talent, those teams that are able to produce that talent, they will be able to insulate their talent from Tasmania because presumably clubs will still have their own NGA access and certainly Northern Academy access when Tasmania comes. So if you can preserve your own talent, that's going to really place your club in a good spot for when Tassie is taking the best talent. Darth Jarjash says, hot take compensation picks shouldn't exist. I, uh, I probably should have included that in the same thing because I am one who does like the idea of compensation picks or at least... It, it, it's more that I worry about what the league would look like if the bottom teams continually lost their best players and received nothing in return. Of course, it needs tweaking and produces bizarre outcomes. So perhaps if we lessen the compensation, I don't mind that too much. But in my opinion, I, I'm just not a huge fan of free agency in general. It is not aligned with competitive fairness at all. It is a mechanism for players to walk to the club of their choice more easily. And that, that's fine. I just accept that's part of the game now. But I think it's a real problem if, if teams, particularly bottom teams, are losing their best players and not getting any recourse through the draft. I think that is a problem. I suppose the response will be a very capitalist attitude and, and that the best teams will be able to recruit the talent and they'll be rewarded for that. I mean, yeah, true. But I do like a little bit of equality and equalization in the league, a little bit. Hazabang says the 50 meter rule is too great a penalty for certain infringements like not standing properly can result in a set shot in the goal square. The penalty should be brought back to like 30 meters. That's not a bad point, I think. You know, we gotta consider the modern landscape right now and um, things have changed and therefore it is so much more easy to give away a 50 meter penalty, certainly than it used to be. And if that is the case, then I think there is an argument for dropping that 50 meters down to 30 meters. Everyone hates seeing their team concede a 50 meter penalty because of something stupid like putting their foot over the line or talking back to the umpire. If that becomes 30, I actually don't think that's a big problem. That's a reasonable, unpopular opinion. I like it, has a bang. Marcus Marcus says, round zero, opening round needs to bite the dust. Seriously, does anyone like it? I don't see the problem with it. It's just more football, right? I don't really see the downside of that. Certainly as a content creator, I, I like having an extra week where I can make content and talk about it. PWD65 says, first 18 picks should be absolutely set in stone. If a father, son, or academy player gets drafted by a different club than bad luck. You can trade for him in three years time and pay up to a fair price or earlier if the player requests a trade. I'm sick and tired of the best kids in the draft going to a premiership contenders for free. Yeah, so my take on this is probably that academy picks, we should probably set the first 18 picks in stone, perhaps, maybe the top 10. As someone who likes father-son, I don't want to make it too difficult for players to get their father-sons. When what I mean by that is, sure, we can, we can make it harder to match bids and therefore make it more expensive and put the choice back on the football club. But I don't want to see too many scenarios where it is impossible for a team to get their father-son prospect. Just make them pay a bit more of a fair price. And we've, we've taken a step next year. Um, for father-son specifically, we are in a weird stage of time where like father-son talents are becoming more and more common. And, and further to that, they're becoming the best players in a given draft. This has really exploded in about five years. So I don't know if it's a moment in time. It remains to be seen. But I'm all for you know making it 
more expensive to match it, but we can't take that choice entirely away for clubs. I suppose you could apply the same logic to academy. Anyway, guys, that was quite a lengthy one. So uh, thank you for indulging with me. I hinted, you know, throughout that video, a number of different videos I've got planned uh, up until the draft. Uh, this is my last month in the UK as well. So um, I'm planning to be pretty consistent with content up until the draft. And then sometime after that, I catch a flight home and, and life's about to change. Should be pretty consistent up until that point. Uh, I'm still doing that draft player uh, series where I'm trying to get out one per day. So I hope you're enjoying the content. And uh, for now, I'll say goodbye. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.